Hello and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host Rob. In today's video we're going to be looking at a fighter warlock build and specifically this one is going to be patterned after an NPC in the current campaign I'm running. And she was a character the party met when they were about level 12 or so and I think they parted ways when they were like 13 or 14 and basically they helped her on her like own personal quest and uh, she was a character who accompanied the party and fought beside them. So I really wanted somebody who could be like a peer to them and not be like an anchor holding the party back, but also not like overshadow the party and carry them through encounters. That wasn't what I wanted at all. I wanted somebody who was going to be roughly on the same footing as the party, but not someone who was going to be casting a lot of battlefield control spells, not somebody who was going to be swaying encounters one way or the other. She'd just, you know, help out with some damage, but could also help to direct the story and give the player some guidance. And just to give you some background on, on the NPC, although it's not really that important, we're mostly going to be focused on the build, but, you know, just to give you a story, uh, her name was Yan Xiaoling. She's from, well, she's like the only daughter of this, like, noble family, and she marries the leader of this other noble family in order to, like, unite their people and end this war, right? And they're all from this region in my world called Jian, and Jian is um, kind of patterned after, like, ancient China, with a bit of like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Korea kind of all mixed in, right? My wife's from Vietnam. Uh, I have some friends from Cambodia. So I kind of wanted to steal some of their like legends of lore and mix some of that in with China. And I also went to Vietnam when my wife and I uh, first had our daughter. Uh, we wanted that, you know, my wife's family to be able to meet her and stuff. So we went to Vietnam and I really, really loved Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, of course. And uh, it's a very dirty city, but it's a very, like, alive city. And there's just, like, all the sidewalks are just covered in people selling stuff. And, like, it just, it just felt like anywhere you went, there was just, like, tons of people. And the city was, like, very, very, um, just very, very interesting. And then they had night markets and stuff. So even at night, people are out, like, selling stuff. And uh, so I stole a lot of that for my game world. In my game world, though, the capital city of... Uh, of Jen has uh, more of a black market aspect to the night market, but you know, still, I thought it was a cool place. But anyways, uh, Xiao Ling and all her people are actually exiles from there. They lost some war like 300 years ago, and all their clans were like essentially exiled, right? So she marries this other guy in order to unite the people and end the war. But they are betrayed because it turns out there's a large cabal of people who don't want the war to end, right? They kind of like the war. Uh, one of these people ends up being her father. So they murder her husband, they murder her six-month-old son, both right in front of her. But because her father can't bring it upon himself to murder his only child, he decides to be merciful and only chop off her sword hand instead. So she's locked in this tower, although they do allow her to go to the garden every day for nice idyllic walks, under a heavy guard, of course. Uh, you know, because they're so nice. Um, so that's her life for the next ten years. But then she is rescued, essentially, by this other NPC in my world called the Iron Mage. And the Iron Mage had the distinction of being the only level 20 NPC, or character, period, in my entire game world at the creation of the world. Now, the player characters in that last campaign eventually got the 20 themselves, so now the Iron Mage has some company. Uh, but he's basically a, a level 2 fighter and a level 18 wizard. And he wears this, like, magical plate mail that's covered in all these, like, arcane glyphs and ruins and stuff. And it basically functions as, like, plus three plate mail, plus a robe of the arc bad guy on top of that. And he, like, created himself because he's, like, this magical smith guy, right? So, anyways, he comes to, to uh, Zhao Ling and offers her the opportunity to serve him and uh, swear, like, her service to him. And in return, he will give her the power to free herself from the garden and... Tell her how to get back her dead husband, which she's ambivalent towards, and her son. But she figures, you know, I'm going to be there anyway. Might as well get my husband to you, right? And she agrees. So he gives her this glass hand. And the glass hand, uh, basically, that's when she becomes a warlock. So she ends up with her like all her warlock levels after that. And for the character, I ended up going with Battlemaster Fighter and then Hexblade Warlock. And the reason I went Battlemaster is because I figured this character is a noble. She's, you know, she's been groomed to, like, leadership and command since an early age because, you know, she doesn't have any brothers to 
run the clan, and they are a fairly patriarchal society still, but, you know, she's the only uh, heir to the throne, so, you know, might as well be her, right? But I also saw as being a more of a charismatic leader. So she's not necessarily, like, heavy invested in strength or dex, plus she's some, like, you know, five foot two little Asian girl, so, you know, I didn't see her being, like, some huge hulking brute, like a Brianna of Tarth, even though I love Brianna of Tarth. I saw her being more um, trained and skilled. So something like Champion didn't really make sense. I didn't like Eldritch Knight as much. I think Eldritch Knight would have been a great choice, by the way. Uh, it would have given her a lot of spell slots and would have helped to alleviate that issue. But I didn't see her having any Eldritch background. I saw her being more of a trained fighter who has like probably a professional man-at-arms who instructs her in different fighting styles and stuff, right? But then when she gets her magical powers from the Iron Mage, then she becomes the Warlock. And uh, the Iron Mage, by the way, is a battle mage, or a war wizard, sorry. Uh, you know, just the worst subclass of wizard ever. But it made sense why then she would be a Hexblade, because, you know, it's the war aspect, and, you know, all that, right? So the Hexblade Warlock also gives her some nice abilities as well, going past the story. Oh, uh, let's finish the story, sorry, real quickly. Um, so her mission is she has to go to the Realm of Death, and get back the souls of her husband and son, right? Return them back to the world of the living, essentially. And I kind of liked the idea, there's a lot of like myths about people going into the realm of death to retrieve loved ones and stuff. And also these kind of like games with death or games with the devil, these Faustian bargains, like playing the fiddle against death or against the devil or whatever. And I like those kind of ideas, right? And I didn't want my party to actually have to fight the death god, because I see him as just being like way beyond them, even at level 12 or 13 or whatever they were when they met him, right? So they actually end up playing him a game of like Texas Hold'em for all these people's souls, right? And uh, it could have gone either way, but the odds were slightly stacked in the party's favor, I think. And um, they end up winning and getting back to Helen's husband and her son and escape the realm of death. And uh, one of the reasons why she has the glass hand isn't just because of its cool magical abilities. It's also because the way they enter is uh, there's this magical gate, right? I kind of like the idea that in order to go to the realm of death, you actually have to be dead. But I have this one gateway, which is like barred in like these magical chains, and it can only be broken by like the weapon of the death god, which was conveniently enough stolen by the god of trickery and hidden in some like weird, obscure, abandoned temple, right? So the party recover the sword, but no creature of flesh and bone can use the sword. Of course... With the glass hand, she's able to get around that, and Zhao Ling's able to carry the sword and use it to smash the chains. They're able to go through the, the, the gate of the living and enter the realm of death in the flesh. They beat death and Game of Texas hold them and recover the souls, leave. Of course, death had sworn that he wouldn't stop them if they won. That was one of the things they got out of him. But he sends a bunch of his servants to go stop them instead because, you know, death's a dirty cheater. And, but they managed to have the fight with all these things, including some, like, fallen angel chick that was, like, super powerful. They managed to beat her, though. They managed to escape. They got across the bridge, through the gate, back into the lands of the living, and, like, close the gates behind them kind of thing and escape, right? And then, you know, Zhao Ling goes her way. The party goes their way, right? So, anyways, like I said, she's a battle master fighter. I gave her um, repost, precision attack, mostly both because I thought that that kind of played into the idea of her being... A skilled fighter. She's quite defensive. I gave her the duelist fighting styles, but she also uses a shield, right? And she wears plate mail. So I saw her being more of an opportunist. But for her third ability, I gave her a trip attack, mostly because I thought that she's also willing to play dirty. You know, she's not above uh, some underhanded tactics now and then, right? But then these also played very well with a bunch of her abilities. So we'll talk about some of that synergy in a moment here, right? Like I said, for the, for the Hexblade... Of course, she gets her Hexblade's Curse. She gets her ability to wear medium armor, which is pointless because she has fighter armors and weapons. So that was redundant. Uh, but she also gets, of course, her Pack Magic. And she gets, at level 6, she gets her Agonizing Spectre. Which, by the time, if you're just a straight-up level 6 Warlock, that's not a bad ability. By the time you're level 12, Spectre isn't particularly good. But we'll talk about him more specifically later. Because he still made a very nice scouting tool. Just the fact that he had incorporeal movement and she could send him through walls or doors or through roofs and ceilings. Or roofs and ceilings. Roofs, roofs and floors. There we go. And using the scout made him very effective still. So that was pretty nice. 
Also, um, I liked the idea that, you know, whenever she killed that humanoid for the first time, she'd use her, like, glass hand to summon up a spirit. Because, oh, uh, for anybody who's ever read The Chronicles of Coram by Michael Moorcock, he's the same guy that wrote the Elric books, uh, I think Coram is actually where the hand and eye of Vecna are kind of loosely based. Because Coram ends up getting captured in his books, he gets tortured, they chop off his hand and put out his eye, right? He meets this wizard guy who gives him this jeweled hand and eye, which belong to these two dead gods. And usually he has the eye covered with an eye patch, because it's like really weird looking, right? But if he removes the eye patch, the eye lets him see into this like realm of death, essentially. It's just like this gray druid landscape. But there's like these figures in it, and they look kind of almost like zombies. They're all like maimed and mutilated, and they've got all these stab wounds and arrows and spears still sticking out of them, right? But using the hand, he's able to summon these people from this crazy, like, death realm, right? And then they kill whoever he wants them to kill. But when they're done, they drag these people away, whether he wants them to or not. And uh, the next time he uses the eye to look into the spirit realm, the warrior guys are gone. But the guys they killed are now there instead, waiting for their chance to get summoned out of the cave and kill whoever so that they can replace themselves and then go to their afterlife and find eternal rest or whatever, right? And it just keeps going. It keeps summoning new things. They kill something. They then replace themselves with whatever the new thing that they killed, right? And I thought that was cool. So I liked the idea of whenever she kills that humanoid and she gets her cursed specter, she like summons it up with the hand, you know, and beckons it out. That was just a RP touch. Anyways, um, for her... Uh, invocations, I gave her Agonizing Blast with, uh, with uh, Grasp of Hadar. I think that Agonizing Blast, obviously, is a great choice, especially if you're going to max your Charisma. Grasp of Hadar, I think it's a very solid choice, but I don't think it was necessarily the best. Obviously, if you want to go with like a Darkness Devil Sight combo, that might be even stronger. Uh, whatever. I think there's other really, really good choices. But again, I just like the thematic idea of her like pulling guys towards her with the hand. You know, she it'll just blast them and then she pulls them towards her, right? I like that idea. I just thought it was a cool thematic feel. Uh, the last one I gave her was Elder Smite, though, because of course she's gonna be in melee a lot, so she might as well be smiting guys, because Elder Smite is awesome. Maybe not quite as good as Paladin Smites, but pretty darn close. Uh, the other thing about Elder Smite is you can knock guys prone, so we'll talk about that more in a second as well. Uh, the spells didn't really matter as much. I didn't give her really any battlefield control spells. I didn't want her, like, dominating the combats and stuff. She was just there to, like, be interesting and give the party some guidance, like I mentioned, and then just be a source of damage. But I could also scale up the encounters to make them a little more difficult in order to compensate for the fact that the party has this extra NPC with them, right? But if she's suddenly casting, like, hypnotic patterns and she's doing a whole bunch of other crazy stuff, that's a lot harder to balance for. So, and I didn't really want her doing that. I saw her more as just using the magic through the hand to, like, just fight even better, right? That was kind of that thing I wanted there, right? I did give her, like, Armor of Agathis, which, of course, is just a great spell in general if you're going to be up in melee combat a lot. Um, Misty Step to give her a bit more, uh, you know, maneuverability. I also gave her Comprehend Languages because she is kind of a diplomat, too, right? She is the leader of her, of her house now. And needs to be able to negotiate with different people. So I thought that would just be a, an interesting choice, right? But most of the other spells, I give her like Spirit Shroud and stuff like that, you know. I didn't give her Counter Spell, even though obviously that would have been a very strong choice. Um, you know, cause, just because I didn't want her to have Counter Spell. I wanted the party to do that kind of stuff, right? And then usually I would just use her Spell slots to just smite with and stuff, right? So, you know, that was okay. That was perfectly fine. So, some of the things that I thought worked really, really well on this character. Like I said, you could trip attack a guy or Elder Smite a guy, either way, and knock him prone. And then follow it up with more attacks. And you could even action surge. So now you're getting advantage because the guy's prone. And now you action surge and you're able to just stack all those attacks, right? This worked really, really well with things like, say, the Hex Spell or the Hex Blade's Curse. And now you're just getting to apply that damage on all those subsequent hits, right? And also the Hexblade's Curse allows you to crit on a 19 or 20. So let's say she opens with a trip attack, knocks the guy prone. She can now attack with advantage, critting on a 19 or 20, 
even action surge and attack like three times against this prone target now, right? So you trip him, you attack, then you action surge, you attack twice more. And if any of those crit, she could then just lay down an Elder Smite on that crit. So that was a lot of big damage potential, right? I also thought that even though I gave her Sword and Shield, I really think that going with, say, like, Poem Mastery or Great Weapon Mastery or both would have been very, very strong. You could knock a guy prone. Maybe you don't give yourself the minus five penalty originally, right? You trip attack a guy, you knock him prone. Now you follow that up with your minus five plus tens and you action surge and you're just doing tons of damage on top of that, right? Plus you've got things like your, your uh, Hexblade's Curse or your Hex Spells and those are just stacking up even more damage on top of the target, right? I didn't go crazy giving her magic items. She has a plus two sword and a plus one plate mail, and that is it for a level 12 character, right? Because again, I didn't want her to have like a bunch of really great stuff, right? But even as it is, just with your plus five charisma bonus from the Hexblade, because she's using that instead of strength, right? If you're attacking a couple times around, that's 10 damage both those hit. She's got four damage from Dula. She's got four more damage from her plus two sword, right? So already you're looking at like 18 damage, um, if you're looking at a long sword, your average damage is like 4.5, so two hits is going to be nine more damage. So you're looking at 27 damage, and this is without any hex or hex blades curse. This is without her dropping any smites. This is without an action surge. So you know once you this is without using any of her maneuvers, right? Which all add to her damage, right? So it's very easy to start getting to like 35, 40 damage in a round without even action surging a lot of times and that was a lot more damage than I was expecting her to do. I honestly thought that if I looked at say a level 6 paladin level 6 warlock which is a character I've played before and was very very effective I thought that that would probably be the stronger mix. You'd have extra spell slots on the paladin that you can use for smites. You've got the the divine smites that you can now stack with your elder smites right. You've got your aura protection there's just so much synergy between those two classes. I thought that would definitely be the stronger mix. And I think it is slightly stronger still. Don't get me wrong. But the fighter ended up being way more effective than I thought. I thought it would be a good mix. But the proficiency on constitution saving throws was really nice, right? For your concentration. Action surge. Great, of course. The different maneuvers to like really help out and to set up some of these like things like a trip attack. Or like I said... If she had gone with Great Weapon Mastery, using Precision Attack to help overcome that minus five penalty, for example. Very, very strong, right? Um, there was just a lot of really, really nice things there. And the character was, in a lot of ways, stronger than I had expected. So, I thought it was a really interesting character. I thought that it functioned very, very well. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, in combat, obviously we've mostly been talking about melee combat. But just the fact that you have Eldritch Blast, you've got El Agonizing Blast, this really overcomes one of the problems that a lot of, especially strength-based uh, characters end up having, which is that you just have no good ranged options, right? So whether you're a fighter using strength, you know, or you're a barbarian, or you're a paladin even, that tends to be one of the places you struggle, is what if you can't get into melee range? You know, in this case... You've always got Agonizing Blast as a nice follow-back. Um, and because she was like level 12 when she met the party, she's already firing off three Eldritch Blasts around. She's doing pretty good damage from rain combat or from melee combat. Uh, another thing that I really thought was quite good on this character, and one reason why I might want to play this type of character in a campaign, is because with your Cursed Spectre, as I mentioned, she had a nice scouting tool. And one thing that these type of characters also really struggle, usually, is that you tend to be really good in the combat pillar. And because you've got charisma on your warlock, you're also pretty good in the social pillar. But you don't tend to have a lot in the exploration pillar. And I thought this character was pretty decent. Not saying that she was phenomenal. Not saying that it's, you know, the greatest exploration character ever or anything. But the fact that this character had incorporeal movement, you could use him to scout gave you a really, really nice option that a lot of times you just don't have. And if you took different spell choices instead of just going all combat spells like I did on her, uh, I think that, you know, things like invisibility or greater invisibility, if those were options, 
would really help to flush out the character even more and make them even excel in that pillar even more. And then, of course, you've got the social pillar, which we already mentioned. Because you're a warlock and you have good charisma, you can take proficiency on things like persuasion, deception, or whatever else. And you have a character who functions well in all three pillars of play. And really, and like I said, and functions well in ranged combat, melee combat. You've got some spell options. I thought that it was very, very strong in all those areas. So now let's talk really briefly about the weaknesses. And it's briefly because there weren't really a lot, but there were one weakness that was very, very glaring and another potential weakness that I didn't have to deal with because I didn't play the character as a player character, but I think might arise. So the glaring weakness was that you only had two spell slots for short rest and all your battle master maneuvers relied on short rest. So you were very, very short rest dependent. And in a campaign where you got lots of frequent short rest, that was fine, right? Um, but in a campaign where maybe you're doing like a dungeon crawl or you're on a time limit and you're not able to short rest frequently, it became very difficult, I found, to like kind of like parse out um, when to use the spell slots because you only had two. So I do think that like if you were in a campaign and a dungeon master asked this character that you were playing that was similar to this type of build, said, hey, you know, I really kind of want to give you a nice magic item. Is there anything you had in mind? Take a rod of the Pact Keeper. I don't care if it's a plus one rod, it doesn't matter. Just being able to refresh one of your spell slots is huge on this type of character. You have very, very limited slots. So that was one of the big weaknesses I noticed. Um, it wasn't insurmountable though. Like I said, between your things like your Hexblade's Curse, that's not using a spell slot. So I was on a very nice source of damage. I didn't really cast Hex ever because... You know, even though Hex is a nice spell, not saying anything to the contrary, if you only have two spell slots and you're trying to, like, measure those out, sometimes Hex is a really good investment. You cast it, you just carry it over from fight to fight to fight, right? But sometimes you might not want to just have to always be transferring Hex around, right? So it, it always depends. I use it sometimes. It was quite effective. A lot of times I didn't use it because I wanted to do other things with my spell slot, and that was fine too, right? But the point is, you can't really just like be casting spells all will and nilly. You can't be just dropping smites left, right, and center. You have to be very careful with what you're doing because you've only got very limited resources. So I think that this character is very, very powerful, and your burst potential in any given fight is just astronomical. But, like I said, under time constraints where you can't short rest a lot, that you have to start getting a lot more judicious over how you use your abilities. The other weakness that I never had to personally deal with is that six levels of fighter is a lot of fighter investment on a character who wants to also be able to cast spells, right? So if all you wanted was action surge and the ability to have constitution saving throws and maybe even a couple battle master maneuvers, three levels of fighter would have worked fine. She could have taken Thirsting Blade as an invocation and gotten her extra attack that way instead. I think that would have been Perfectly fine, right? It's not that six was bad, right? Because now A, she doesn't have to take Thirsting Blade. She gets an extra ability score increase at Fighter 4 and another one at Fighter 6. So those aren't bad things. I'm not saying this is a bad choice by any means. I'm just saying that when you're playing those kind of characters, um, it can feel really easy to get discouraged at certain points in your career because once you start multi-classing, it can feel like you're falling behind other player characters. And it can feel like you're kind of gimping yourself in some areas. This is one reason why some people don't like multi-classing. But personally, I love it. Because, you know, I just suffer through the pain knowing that my end goal is, uh, is, is glory and greatness, right? And I do think that when you're playing the character as opposed to an NPC who got to start at the same level as the party was already at, you don't have to play through or play through those growing pains, right? So that's a, a thing you just never had to worry about. So having not played this as a player character, I don't know how those stages would have been. I think it probably would have been fairly okay, you know? You're still a fighter at lower levels. Nothing wrong with that, right? Then you start adding the Warlock stuff in. I think that's pretty solid too. You might want to go higher than, like with a higher strength or dex score than I gave her. 
but I didn't have to worry about it because I knew she was going to have the 20 charisma and she was going to be Hexblade, right? Uh, as far as alternative, I do think that some of the other fighter subclasses would work really, really well. Like I said, Eldritch Knight might be a very strong choice, giving you more spell slots and really alleviating one of those problems. And spells like Shield start looking a lot more valuable on this type of character if you're not casting it with a fourth level spell slot because your patch spells automatically scale, right? Now you've got some low-level spells you can use as an Eldritch Knight. It doesn't really matter if they're keyed off your intelligence. You take things like Shield. You take things like Find Familiar. None of those things really have to care about intelligence at all, right? As far as other Warlock options, I think Hexblade was by far the strongest for this type of character. But I do think you could probably make a Pact of the Fiend work quite well. Um, the ability to get those temporary hit points every time you get a killing blow and then you're up on the front line a lot, that can really allow you to just fuel this type of like never-ending supply of hit points always flooding into your character. And I think that can be very, very strong. And Fiend has some nice like like fireball and other type of spells that really kind of compensate for the fact that your character doesn't normally have good AoE spells, right? So I think that that's not necessarily a bad combo either. But I think Hexblade was more fitting for this type of NPC. And I think that if I was building a character, it's not that I would rule out Fiend, but I'd probably lean Hexblade still. Um, anyways, that's basically everything I wanted to talk about. I thought that the character was very, very strong. And like I said, I think if you optimize it more, that, you know, taking things like, like I said, I specifically didn't want her to have Great Weapon Mastery or Polearm Mastery. Or some of those other types of feats. Because again, it can get very easy to start overshadowing your party members when you start doing that kind of stuff. And that's specifically what I didn't want her to do. But if I was playing this kind of character in a campaign, and if I was playing with other characters, or other players, sorry, who I knew tend to optimize for combat, then I might be a lot more willing to go that route. And I think that Grim Mastery... It's very easy to overcome that minus five penalty once you start adding in some of these other abilities like your trip attacks and your, you know, your ability to smite a guy, knock him prone, follow it up with attacks with advantage to overcome that that way. I think that's very solid. I think spells like Armor of Agathis are very good on the separate character. I think spells like Spirit Shroud combined with the Action Surge, you can really start get, getting a lot more mileage off of those type of spells, right? And I think there's a lot of good stuff there. And um, just the ability to cast like a full spell and then action surge and follow that up with a bunch of attacks is not to be underestimated as well. It was a very, very strong, strong character. And like I said, she really performed well, especially in combat and in the social pillar, but she wasn't terrible in the exploration pillar as well. And so you really had a character who could kind of do it all and... It was a very fun NPC to play, actually. I really enjoyed her. And that's what made me think that it would be a fun character to play in a campaign. So anyways, that's everything I wanted to say for this video. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, of course, ring the bell for notifications. But I would really love to see people's comments on this video and see like, hey, what about this invocation? Or what about this subclass? Or what about this feat or that feat or whatever else, right? Um, I think the Lucky Feet would have been a really strong choice on a character like this. I just didn't think it applied to a girl who uh, saw her husband and child murdered right in front of her and got her hand chopped off and was locked in a tower for 10 years. That wasn't particularly lucky. So uh, I didn't give her that feat. But, you know, I think that things like that would have been a very strong choice. Of course, alert would have been a good choice. But there's so many good ones that you could have given a character like this. And if you think of her as, say, a variant human, starting with a feat and then getting a uh, ability score increase at Fighter 4, Fighter 6... And Warlock 4, you know, you've got three ability score increases and a free feat. If you use even two of those, let's say she starts with 16 charisma, you bump that to 18 and then 20. That still gives you another ability score increase and a feat choice. You know, possibly two feats, depending on how you want to play it. So, you know, that's not too bad. You're a level 12 character. Your main stat that you use for spellcasting and attacking is maxed out. And, you know you got a couple of feet choices. I think that you could do a lot with that type of character. I think like 12, 13, 14, this is when this kind of character is really, really going to start to look good. So, I mean, part of it could have just been good timing. That's when the party met her. That's what level she was, right? 
But even at lower levels, I think he'd probably be okay. It might be a little rough when you first start transitioning to Warlock and you don't really have any spell slots to deal with. You don't have any good spells. But I do think that it would probably be all right. Um, like I said, six levels of fighter is a heavy investment for somebody who wants to be a, a spellcaster, right? But I don't think it's the end of the world. I think it worked out to be pretty strong. Um, anyways, like I said, that's everything. I've already tried to end this video a couple times now. We're turning into like a uh, fellowship of the ring here where we just keep going and going after you think it's going to end. But anyways, this is the end. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.